Father, thank you for hearing our prayers, and we thank you again for who you are and for all that you have done. And Father, as we get into your word now, we are really asking, Father, that you would do whatever is necessary, that God the Holy Spirit would be free here today to do what he'd like to do. And I pray that he would open up hearts and minds to receive a word from him, from your word. And Father, we pray that you would just remove anything that would hinder that. I also, Lord, just come before you, laying myself out here completely, and asking that nothing that you want to do through me today would hinder your word from flowing today. Also, Father, I acknowledge that I am here as a student and a listener and a learner as well. And so, Father, we want to just humble ourselves before you. We know how important your word is, Lord. Your word says you have exalted your word above all. And Father, we are in the, in the best of our understanding, Lord, seeking to get to know you as the living word, Father, Christ as that living word through the written word written by God, the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we are trusting God, the Holy Spirit, to teach, to preach, whatever he would like to do today. And we pray specifically that each person here will get a word from you for their life, that they will know it's from you and it's for them. And we are looking, Lord, for you to do some great and mighty things that are supernatural to the next level, Lord, of experiencing you as our God. So we just commit this time to you. In Christ's name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Romans chapter 6. And so we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 23. So we will ask you to stand at this time. And let's see if we can read that together, okay? Romans chapter 6, um, starting at verse 16 through verses 23, okay? We'll start that together, and I will um, fade out at the end there. Let's read together. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and slaves to God, you derive the benefit of the love of your sanctification and the outcome of your life. For the wages of sin is death, but the freedom of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may have a seat. Today's sermon is entitled Slavery, and uh, slavery is one of those topics that never seems to go away, does it? We might find ourselves in some kind of discussion about slavery. We might be talking about slavery here in America in the past and slavery in other nations in the past. There are places right now, ladies and gentlemen, you already know this and I don't mean to insult you, but there are places right now on, in our world, on our planet, where somebody is in slavery this very moment that you're sitting in church. There are people who are slaves today. There are people who are being abducted to, to be slaves, and there are to be people who are taken as slaves to serve other people, whether it has to do with sex or anything from making um, new shoes for people. Slaves are put in these kind of positions. So there are all kinds of people being abducted into slavery today. There are some this week who are pontificating about how that there are athletes in our country who are multimillionaires and talk show hosts who are multimillionaires that are still slaves, as these folks would say, on the plantation of a different kind. They're still slaves. Someone's talking about slavery, and it's amazing the perspectives that people bring to this topic of slavery. Multimillionaires on a plantation, still as slaves, some would say. Slavery is kind of like opinions. Everybody has one. Everybody has something to say. They have some commentary about um, slavery. You know, God's word has some things to say about slavery. 
It has a few things to actually say about slavery. And sometimes in your Bible, the word slave is also translated servant. So I want to make sure you got that. You heard that term bond servant, a slave, a servant, a bond servant. They're all interrelated. Um, the Bible seems to express that there's a truth that we want you to get from the very beginning. And that truth is that everybody serves somebody. The Bible teaches that everybody serves somebody. Every one of us is a slave to somebody. Every one of us is a slave to somebody. And you gotta get this, stay with me today. And ultimately, but behind every somebody and every something that we can be a slave to, there are some somebodies. Did you get that? I hope I didn't lose you. Behind every kind of person, whoever the boss is, including you, if you're your own God, there's a somebody behind that. There's always somebody. We are serving somebody directly or indirectly, even if we don't know it, okay? Are you staying with me now? Stay with me today. We gotta put on our thinking caps. The Bible also communicates that uh, serving or slaving can be a good thing, okay? Serving or slaving can be a good thing too. The Bible communicates that, and it can be a bad thing. I think we're well aware of that. So I wanna ask us, ask us the question I asked you moments ago, who or what are you and I a slave or a servant to? Who or what are you and I a slave or a servant to? In other words, who or what are we serving this morning? Who or what are we serving this morning? So it's, it's what, March the 18th, 2018. Who or what are you and I serving this morning? Is our service or our slavery, since we are doing it, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? As I mentioned, God's word um, is not silent on slavery or service. And so we're going to just walk through a couple of things. I'm not going to spend much time here, but I just want to move past some of the basics that maybe you have forgotten or maybe you weren't aware of. Um, we're going to move past 1 Timothy 1.10, if you want to write that down, where there are some things listed by the Apostle Paul that the body of Christ should not be involved in. Some things listed by the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, some things the body of Christ should not be involved in. And the word is translated kidnapping in the New American Standard. It's translated, quote, enslavers, end of quote, in the English Standard Version. And here's what the word that we're talking about, kidnapping or enslaver, enslavers, means. It means those who take someone captive in order to sell him or her into slavery. Okay? So Paul is telling Timothy to make sure, and remember, Timothy is over not just one church, but many churches. He says that, Timothy, as you're over these churches, make sure God's people understand there are some people that need to be under the law. There are some people that need to be forced to do what is right, and a part of that group are these people who capture other people and sell them into slavery. They're thinking logically to the wrong conclusion. They need to be under the law. So kidnapping or enslaving, very simply put, is not for the saints. It's not for the saints. And so Paul was schooling Timothy on that and reminding him of that. We move past that and we move just very briefly into the book of Philemon. And our church has a thing, Philemon or Philemon. Pick your choice, whichever one you'd like. And so Philemon 16 is there and Paul tells this Christian Philemon who had a slave who ran away from him. Okay, so he's talking to him. This particular one runaway slave's name was Onesimus, and he ends up in jail with Paul. So, you know, if you end up with jail, in jail with Paul, you're probably going to hear the gospel. So Onesimus gets saved in jail, and then Paul says, you know what you got to do, right? You got to go back to your master. Okay, there's a way we do things around here. So he wrote this letter, this man is saved, and he goes back to his master Philemon, okay? And so in the letter, he has this letter to him, and he says, and the letter says, um, Phil, um, um, Philemon, brother Onesimus, is now your brother in Christ. So he's going to be much more to you than a slave. He's going to be better than a slave could ever be. He's your brother in the Lord now. And then he tells him, and oh, um, Philemon, forgive him. And I know he stole some stuff from you. Would you charge that to my account? And then Paul says, oh, by the way, get my guest room ready too. Get my guest room, because when I get out of here, I'm going to come see you. 
I kind of laugh because what Paul is saying is he's asking Philemon to really do something radical because in Rome at that particular time, if your slave ran away, you could kill your slave. And if your slave stole something from you and ran away, you could kill him on sight, okay? That was the law. That was the law. So what Paul is saying is, oh, we're going to do something a little bit different here. You take this letter, you go back, and he's saying, Philemon, I want you to treat him as a Christian brother, and what he stole, put that to my account. I'll take care of that. And then, Philemon, I'm going to make sure that a brother's doing what I'm asking. I'm not going to force you or command you. I'll get my room ready because I'm going to come and see how you're doing. In other words, I'm going to come and see how you handle this situation. I want to see how you treat Onesimus. I want to see what you've done with that. So Paul has been working there and he's doing some things. So that was a really interesting thing there in the book of Philemon. So we're just touching on that, that Paul was working against slavery right there and it was starting to take hold and it was, it was, it was actually growing. You know, we get a very good, um, excuse me, example there that is so pertinent to March 18th, 2018 in America. Because what happened was, in Rome, he had all rights, Congress, the Senate, the House had passed the laws, put the laws out that if your slave steals something and run away, go ahead and kill him, we'll give you the bullets if we need to. Amen? But what we learn here, folks, and we've got to make sure we get this just on a little sm slight bunny trail, just because your government says something is right does not mean that it's right in God's sight. It, just because our government says something is right, it does not mean that it's right in God's sight. We have to obey the word of God. We have to obey God rather than men. So we're just looking at some things here. The Bible has a lot to say about slavery, so we just kind of touched on those uh, just very briefly. The Bible has really um, got some a variety when it comes to slavery. Listen to this. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 7, that the borrowers are slaves of the lenders. Mm-hmm. You see, you get that one? Okay, those who are borrowing are slaves to the lenders. The Bible also says in Matthew 6, 24, it teaches something about human beings. Matthew 6, 24 says this, you as a human being can't serve two masters. Okay, you really can't be a slave or serve two masters. You've got one there that you're going to put at the top and you're going to serve that one. You can't serve two masters wholeheartedly. Then Romans 8.15 says this about having a spirit or a disposition of slavery. And what it's teaching is even after you have been set free as a slave, you can still have a slave mentality or disposition. You know, oh, I, I couldn't go there. I could never do that. God would never do that for me because I still have a slave. I'm, not, I'm a slave. I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm sub of everybody else. And so you can be set free and still have a slave mentality. The Bible says in Romans 8, 15, that we can have that spirit, that disposition of slavery, even after we've been set free. We don't believe it and we don't act like it. OK, the Bible speaks of being a, in a lifelong slavery to Satan because we are afraid to die, that we can be slaves to Satan for our whole lifetime because we are afraid to die. Saints, you know this. I'm not telling you anything new. But as long as you're afraid to die, you're never going to live your life to the fullest. You'll never be everything that God intended for you to be if you're afraid to die. Do you know Satan has kept many people as slaves because they're afraid to die. They're not really willing to live because they're afraid to die. Hebrews says that in Hebrews 2.15. The Bible, as I said, speaks about slavery. And so as we get into this, when we get into John chapter 8, and Jesus talks about committing sin and being a slave of sin. And Jesus is saying, if you're committing sin, you are a slave of sin, okay? And he starts to bring that out, and his audience is really offended because these are Jewish religious leaders. And so we got to get this, and we were touching on this a little bit in Sunday school this morning, okay? That if I can't do what I ought to do, I'm a slave. Whatever needs to be done, and I can't do what I ought to do, I'm a slave. Or, if I can't stop doing what I need to stop doing, I'm a slave to it. Are you following that? So we, we kind of get this up. It's, if, if, if I can't do what I ought, sin's in the camp. And if I keep on doing what I should not, sin is in the camp. I am literally, the Bible says, living as a slave to sin. Living as a slave to sin. 
So when we come into relationship with Christ, we are literally set free from slavery to sin. We're set free. And so the thing is just like Juneteenth, you're familiar with that, the slaves were set free, but they didn't know it, so they continued to be slaves. That's a lot of what goes on in our Christian walk as well. What we don't know does hurt us. What we don't know can hurt us. If we don't know we're free, we don't live free. Are we following that? Okay, so John 8, 36, in this context, it says this very famous verse. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. We use that from everything, from getting divorces to you name it. You know, you can be set free. You know what I'm saying? The Son has set you free. But the context is set, being set free from being a slave to sin. That if Jesus sets you free, you really are free. You're free indeed. So allow me to get technical for just a moment because this kind of gives us a little help too. If, so if, so if, so if, so if the Son makes you free. So if, the if there in our verse is one that involves the will, okay? So it is, there's different types of ifs. This is not if assumed true for argument's sake. This is not it. This is an if that says if you engage your will, the Son will set you free. So get this, saints. Um, you can be set free, but you know what? You got to involve your will. We have to choose to believe God. We have to choose to believe God, and listen to this, and then we have to choose to let him set us free. Amen. We have to choose to let God set us free, and then listen to this, and we have to choose to remain free. Amen. We have to choose. Our will is involved. Amen. Heaven help us all to do it. Heaven help us all to do it. Ephesians 1, 7 says this, Christ redeemed us, and the word redeemed means purchased us off of the slave block of sin. Purchased us off the slave block, okay? That's what it means. Christ redeemed us, and Christ said, I've purchased you, I've bought you, you're free. Go, you're free. Christ purchased you and set us free. Each one of us, okay? All of us, okay, if you're a Christian. So as we get into this, here's some more scriptures you, you know and understand. I hope you're tracking with me today. Romans 6, 6 says this, that the old you, the old you, who used to, you used to be before you got saved, was crucified with Christ. And because of that crucifixion, you no longer, I no longer have to be a slave to sin. Are you following that? I no longer have to be that. The old me was crucified. And so sin needed the old you to actually wreak all this sinful havoc in our lives, okay? So sin and the old you work together, and that's why we sin. God said, I crucified the old you. The sin has the tag team partner is no longer there, so you are free. You don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. So it says, don't you know that? Are you aware that, that you were crucified with Christ? You don't have to be a, sin, a, a slave to sin anymore. Don't have to be. God took, their, took care of that at the cross. Romans 6, 7 says this, you and I are free from sin's power. You and I are free from sin's power. So folks, as we get into this, we're talking about serving, we're talking about these things, we're talking about slavery. We've got to take the first step to find out what God says and to actually believe what God says. Not our circumstances, our feelings, or what someone else is saying. What does God say? God says, you know what? You have been set free. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection set us free. You, the old you, was crucified with Christ. Therefore, you are set free. You don't have to be a slave to sin. Then Romans 6, 11 says this. Count these truths to be true. Count these truths to be true. Believe what God has said. You're dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You're dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Death in the Bible means an absence of life, but death in the Bible also means separation. Robert Casilla is not absent of life. He has been separated from his physical body. Are you following that? He's still alive and well. He's doing better than all of us. Amen. He's doing better than all of us. He is whole in every way. 
doing better than all of us, wouldn't come back if he had the opportunity. Amen? He's doing better than us. He has been separated from his body. When the Bible talks about being dead to sin, we need to get it just a little bit deeper that somewhere deep down in you, there was a separation made. You got it? You have been separated from sin, and in its place, you became one spirit with Christ. Okay? So there was a connection made with Christ, there was a separation made from sin, and God says, because of these two things, you don't have to be a slave to sin. I hope you're staying with me. Romans 6.13 says this, so present yourself to God. Present your body to God as an instrument or a weapon that he can use. When you understand who you are, then God says, now present yourself to me so we can go do battle. I want to use you as a weapon or an instrument of righteousness. In case you didn't know, there is a war going on. Amen. There's a war going on. So we need to make a choice. Why? You got to get this from the beginning because you and I are going to serve somebody. You and I need to make a choice because we're going to serve somebody. We're going to obey somebody. We are going to obey somebody. So we need to make a choice about who we're going to serve and who we are going to obey. Let's read Romans 6, 16 together, okay? So we'll put that up on the screen, Wally, and I will turn to it very, no, I'll just wait for you and make it easy on myself. Okay, let's read this together out loud. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? Thank you very, very much. Romans 6.16 is saying this. We present ourselves to somebody and we obey somebody every day. We present ourselves to somebody. We obey somebody every day. And the Bible is saying, present yourself to God. We got two choices here. We present ourselves to God or we present ourselves to sin. Are you following me? And I'm going to give you a little more. You got this. You know this already. But let me remind you. Let me remind you, okay? Let me remind you. Don, I want to ask you to come stand up here. Just take your time. And Dixie, I want to ask you to come stand over here. This is not anything to do with gender, race, anything. It's just two people in an example, okay? All right then, okay, Bill, I wanna ask you to stand over there. Okay, no, you, you can turn around and look around. Yeah, do whatever you'd like to. I can tell you what Don's gonna do. Uh-huh, see, you see him, did you catch it? Uh-huh, see, him. I know him, and I know him well. Okay, now we're going to give you a little illustration here. What did we, what did we just say? You got to serve somebody. You got to obey somebody, okay? And so the Bible's telling you in Romans 6, 16, make a choice. And when you, you make that choice, you are either serving God or you're serving sin. But like I told you earlier, it's not neutral. There's always somebody behind the somebodies and the some things. If you're saying, I serve money, there's even a somebody behind that something. Okay, are you following me? So this is you. This is you. Your bill today. This is you. Okay? Inside of you, there's something called sin. Okay? It isn't, hasn't been eradicated, but you have been separated from it, but it is still in your body. Are you following me? And so as we get to that, the Bible's telling you that sin is in your body, and sin will try to influence you. But you have been set free. You just say, no, I'm dead to that. I don't have to go there. You don't have any power over me. That's not how this thing works. You have been set free. You are free to do the right thing. You're free to serve God, and you're free to do what God would have you to do. But sin is still there, and sin's going to try to whisper to you, okay? But as I told you, it's not that neutral, because what the Bible teaches is that this is sin. Some people like to call it the power of sin, okay? And so it's always trying to influence you. Galatians chapter 5 said the, that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There's a war going on, but it's, it's sin. Sin is the one that's kind of working in there, okay? And so I don't want to confuse you, so let me keep my terms the same. Sin is trying to influence you to do what it wants you to do, and you don't have to anymore. We got that. Good place for an amen. But behind everything, there's a somebody. There are spiritual beings... And we'll just call this one Satan. <laughs> and I told you it's not a gender thing or anything, right? Uh-huh. But what Satan does is 
Satan uses the power of sin to try to get you to do something. So Satan knows, Satan got, got the tendency, knows what, what, what sin, how sin works in you, knows your weakness to a certain extent, 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 excuse me. And so Satan is over here, unaware to you, and is using the power of sin. Why don't you go do this? Why don't I go do this? Do you see that? The power of sin. And yeah, there's some different things there. Oh, here comes your insecurity. Here comes this. Here comes that. There's somebody working behind the scenes, even on this entity, this noun called sin. There's someone trying to influence sin to get you to do what sin would have you do. But it's somebody even behind it over there. Are you guys getting it? I'm trying to illustrate this. I hope my illustration has got to you. That's what I'm saying. There is nothing neutral. You and I are serving somebody every day. And you don't even know it. You don't even know how far away they are, but you're serving somebody. The Bible says you make a choice. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed, but you got to make a choice that you're going to do what God wants, you're going to believe his word, and we're going to act like what God says is true, and we're going to live our Christian life like it is a vocation and not a vacation. Amen. Are you following that? And know that there's always somebody, it ain't nothing new, it ain't nothing neutral, there's always somebody influencing everything that you're doing. Are you guys grabbing a hold of this? You don't see this person. You don't sense this person. All you know is you're struggling. Oh, what's this whole thing of sin? But there's always somebody even behind sin. Satan will use the power of sin to generate thoughts into your mind to get you to sin. You don't have to sin. You have to know who you are, stand on God's word, and you've been given the power to do what God wants you to do. Amen. Is everybody getting it? Can I get some help here? Yes. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Give him a hand, will you? So Romans 6.16 is saying, you know what? You got two choices. Present yourself to God or sin. Because you're going to obey God or sin. And let me let you know, again, there's always somebody behind sin. There's always somebody in the garden, folks. There's always somebody whispering, has God said? You're not free. You don't believe that, do you? You got to live out in this world, honey. I've been like this my whole life. Oh, it's their fault. Oh, it's somebody else's fault. Oh, it's the devil. He'd rather whisper to you, blame him, than you stand on what God's word says. Amen? Because he gets the same results. Leaving God out. Okay, so we move on. So verse 17 there in Romans 6 says um, it teaches us that we should be thankful that we have a choice, that Christians should be thankful they don't have to serve sin. When they serve sin, they're making a choice. We make a choice to yield our members to sin. We make a choice to yield our members to sin. We have a choice. Before we believed, we didn't have a choice. Okay, we were complete slaves and we didn't even know it. That's one that gets people too. They don't realize they're a slave before they get saved. The people who are the most arrogant and think they know the most are people who are unsaved. Amen? Amen? So let's get a little word here. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're just going to read some verses that are very familiar to you. Hang in here with me. And we will continue on here. We, we got to understand that before we were saved, we were complete slaves and we didn't even know it. Amen, that's right. Ephesians 2.1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, separated, remember, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, doing whatever the world wants, according to the prince of the power of the air. Somebody with a red sweater on, okay, somebody with a red sweater on, <laughs> influencing you before you got saved. Are you following it? This spirit is now working in the sons of disobedience. These people are unsaved. Satan is influencing their mind all the time as an unsaved person. They don't even know it. Among them, we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, but God, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us um, with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. 
It is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Don't let sin rule you as a slave master. Sin shows up in many ways. But saints, the biggest way, as someone said today, even in Sunday school, the biggest way that sin shows up as our master is our pride. Under that umbrella pride, there are so many things going on under that one umbrella. If you can just deal with the pride, there's so many things that are tied to pride. Don't let sin be your master. Don't let sin run your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23 says this, you were bought at a price. Not only don't let sin ruin your life, 1 Corinthians 7, 23 says this, and don't let your slave owner become men either. We can go to another type of slavery where we are um, slaves to men and women. Romans 6, says this, you have become a slave of God. And that hurts. That's an ouch for some people, especially certain audiences. You know, you know I, don't, don't even say the word slave to me. Well, to the best of my ability, doulos means slave. And God is saying, you got to understand, you're going to serve somebody. You're going to be somebody's slave, whether you understand it or know it or not. You already are. And so he says, when you get saved, you need to get this mentality. I am God's slave now. I am God's slave now. And sadly, for many in the church, the body of Christ, we don't have the mentality that we are God's slave or God's servant. The mentality is reversed. God is my slave. God is my servant. That's the mentality we have. We're not anybody's slave, including God's. Amen? So Romans, excuse me, Ephesians 6, 6 goes on to say, as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So once again, you're a slave of Yahweh, and you're also a slave of Christ. And you and I should be about doing his will from the heart. 1 Peter 2, 16 says this, as God's slaves, you've been set free, Use your freedom to glorify God. Use your freedom to glorify God. We close today with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Here's what I want to share with you. She was much younger than you. She was much younger than you are. The only person in this congregation that she was, was, uh, was not older or younger than is London. The only one. She was much younger than you. She had more on her plate than you do. An angel comes and tells you, you're going to have a baby without having sexual intercourse. How are you going to explain that to your parents? How are you going to explain that to the world? Who's going to believe that? Who's not going to lock you up in the funny farm? Who's not going to get stones to stone you? I got to deal with all of that. And then I got to have this baby who the angel said is going to be the son of God. She had much more on her plate than you do even though she was much younger than you. She didn't have the blessings. She didn't have the understanding that you have. She didn't have the information you have. She did not have the word of God you have. She did not even have the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension that you have. And she didn't have any kind of information on I died with Christ, I was buried with him, I rose with him, I, I ascended with him, I'm exalted with him, and I'm seated in heavenly places. Never heard such a word. There wasn't such a thing. This is who we're talking about as compared to you, right? But when God gave her her message, Luke 1 38 says this, behold, I am the servant or the bond slave of the Lord. Amen. She understood that with all the limitations she had. Our ultimate slave slash servant example comes from Philippians chapter two. We're gonna be looking at verses five through 11. They're very, very familiar. I want you to read these with me as well. Let's start with verse five. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Did you get that? That the Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of slavery slash service slash obedience, even to the point of death. That's the type of slave slash servant slash obedience Christ did. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was the ultimate servant. We've looked at slavery, servants. We've brought it out. We're all servants. We're all slaves to someone or something. We either serve sin or God. And our slavery slash service can be a very good thing. I just want to bring that to you. And I hope that it was clear. I hope that we're grasping it. Because in closing, I want to say that we don't want to be an anemic body of Christ. I'm not talking even locally, I am, but I'm talking universally. We have to ask the question, are we really experiencing this abundant life we've been promised? Are we really experiencing the victorious Christian life? Are we really people that someone can say, that's a real overcomer? Are you saying? Or are we just kind of quietly faking it till we make it? It's one thing to get up here and, and, and um, be able to preach and teach and do these things. But as I have really been convicted and the Lord is really dealing with me on it, is, is Christ seen, is the fragrance of Christ smelled in my home, in my marriage, with my children, um, in those type of areas? Are we people who are getting up teaching and preaching and espousing things when folks can see all the stuff in our life that really ain't clicking? And here's the sad part. This is what I'm really trying to get us to see, starting with Ron Fox. We don't see our own stuff. We don't see it. We don't see our deficiencies. We don't see our anger, our bitterness, our unforgiveness, our resentments. We don't see our blame, and we don't see those things. And we're honestly blind to them. Everybody else sees them, but we don't. And we think we're okay. There's nothing wrong with me, but there's something wrong with you. Are you following that? That we're able to point out what's wrong with other people, but we honestly don't see our own stuff. Folks, is this all there is to it? Is this all there is? Fake it till you make it? We can't be polite, we throw manners away, we uh, justify our conflicts, justify things, we even water down the Bible to make it go along with our morality. Amen. Are you following me? Amen. And then as the church, we've said this before, we cuddle that stuff, we feed it, we pet it, and we grow it because we are not being the church of speaking the truth and love to people. We are letting people continue on to be legends in their own mind, and they're going in their coffins that way because we're not telling people the truth. Hello, somebody. Do we want to stay here? I don't know what's happening to me. I don't know what's happening to you. But if, is this all there is to it? Some of us are proud to say, this is the way I've always been, this is the way I'm going to be, and I'm going in my grave like this. Is that of Christ? Some of the stuff we're doing, ask this question. Is the Lord leading me to do this? Is the Lord saying this? Or is this just me? Some of you guys have conflicts. We have too many people in our church with conflicts. Some of them are in your own families. Conflicts, not speaking to each other and all this kind of stuff. Is that of Christ? 
That is sin. And somebody's whispering over here, that is sin. And we're continuing this on and we're excusing it. I want to ask you about your marriage. What is it really like? What's really going on? Ask you about your singleness. What's really going on there? What's really going on? I want to lay something on you. You know, it's heavy stuff. We want to jump out of our marriages. But some of us who are jumping out of them are saved. And the Bible says when you jump out of it and you're saved, you got to remain single. Amen. Don't say amen too quick now. Don't say amen too quick. Because usually the people who are saying that, you know, they, where are you really? Where are you really? You see what I'm saying? Where are we really living, folks? Where are we really living? It's just so, is this all there is? Is this it? No. We've been given everything we need for a life of godliness. We're either not believing God or we refuse to engage our will to submit to God. The problem's not God, Ron Fox. The problem's not God, Ron Fox. A lady in the church told me that, I never forgot it. The problem is you. You're not yielding to God. You're not saying yes to God. You're saying, I wanna do what I want. And it may not be in every area, but it is areas. So, we're talking about slavery. And the next time the topic comes up, I want you to ask yourself, is there any area of my life where there's slavery going on of a different type? Because God is saying, you're not to be a slave of sin. Calvary purchased your freedom. Do not be a slave of sin. And I'm not talking to the unsaved. I'm talking to Christians. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we are trusting that you've had your way today. The prayer was the same, Father, a, a rhema word for all of us. We are in a theme of wake-up calls, and this particular wake-up call is a wake-up to look in the mirror and really deal with where I am as far as being a servant of sin. I pray, Father, that you will continue to speak to us, continue to deal with us, and I'm putting my name at the front of this list, at the top of this list, that deep down within my being, that, Lord, I am choosing to allow the Son to set me free and not holding on to things, not holding on to the past, the present, or fearing for the future, but really holding on to you in relationship. And Father, we pray you'll take us to the next level because even in our service, Lord, we, we know that you use us in spite of ourselves. You'd have to. We're not perfect, Lord. We, don't, we, we understand. But Father, help us to see where we're really at because um, we need to know the truth. How do we go to you and lay it on your altar if we don't even know what it is? So Father, have your way. You never intended for us to be slaves to sin. Not after, the, uh, not after all you did, and you had it in mind before any of us were even here. So have your way, Lord, and forgive us, Lord, if we are taking sin lightly, we are excusing sin, and if we're being silent about sin. Um, help us to speak up as well. In Christ's name we pray. May we really choose to serve you today. May we choose loyalty.